This symposium has presented us with new ways to rethink and reposition our canonical collections from international perspectives. And for this, I extend heartfelt thanks to Cindy Mills, Amelia Gerlitz, the staff at Smithsonian American Art Museum, and the Terra Foundation. I must begin my remarks with a qualifier. My German colleagues have cautioned me to be more nuanced in my use of the term anti-Americanism and to acknowledge that many Europeans are not against American people or American society, but rather are critical of our cur current government. I am honored to moderate this panel, Culture, Commerce, and Propaganda, for which I was asked to reflect on an extraordinary cross-cultural experience I had while teaching as a Fulbright Scholar and Guest Professor of American Studies and Art History at the University of Hamburg during the academic year 2002-3. The fraught political climate I faced when I arrived in Germany in September 2002 made the cultural exchange particularly compelling. The contentious Gerhard Schroeder election, which foregrounded the former chancellor's anti-American views, reinforced by the justice minister's scandalous reference to the Nazi tactics of the Bush administration, were followed by the US-led war in Iraq that alienated the US even farther from Germany. For as you know, Germany, a longtime ally of the United States, was at the forefront of the European opposition to the Iraqi war. This tense political climate colored much of my experience as an American scholar teaching American art and culture in Germany. It filtered down quite directly into the art world, as evidenced by this 2001 painting by President George W. Bush by pop artist Richard Phillips, which was pulled by his New York dealer from a retrospective of the artist's work in 2002 at the distinguished Kunstverhein in Hamburg. The American gallerist feared that in this charged atmosphere of anti-Americanism, the work would be vandalized by an angry German public. He clearly did not trust that the painting's irreverent portrayal of America's commander-in-chief would come across as such to a German audience. In this tense political climate, German university students, outspokenly pacifist and allergic to extreme nationalism, were bewildered by the patriotic fervor that swept much of the United States during its initial invasion of Iraq. They even began to question why they were pursuing American studies. This was a disturbing phenomenon because German universities boast some of the strongest American studies programs in Europe, which is why I chose to teach in Hamburg, chose to teach in Hamburg in the first place. Interestingly, German-American studies programs focus on American history and literature, not visual art, and thus German students' knowledge of American art is limited. Usually, they know more about contemporary American art, beginning with pop art. This makes sense because Germans only seriously began collecting American art for their museums in the 1960s. Despite the swift post-World War II reconstruction efforts of the Marshall Plan, it took decades for war wounds to heal. Art history continues to be a Eurocentric discipline in Germany, the country where the profession was officially established. And even though American studies departments in Germany are much more open to American art than art history departments, as Wanda Korn rightly noted on Thursday, many of my students believed that American high culture is an oxymoron and were skeptical at first to accept historical American art as worthy of study. More problematic for me was teaching government-sponsored art of the New Deal as younger generations, in part because of Germany's Nazi past and the more recent socialist policies of the former East, have enormous distrust of and resistance to examining anything that smacks of propaganda. To many, the New Deal was as ideologically insidious as the Third Reich. Thus, my greatest challenge as an American art historian in Germany at a time of rampant anti-Americanism was not to educate German students about the intellectual value of American art or even to unpack deeply ingrained stereotypes, though these were difficult tasks. My greatest challenge, much to my surprise, was to flesh out the distinctions between the public art created in an isolationist democracy versus that produced under a fascist regime. Only after this distinction was made 
was it possible to discuss the similarities between the American and German government's employment of art as a propagandistic vehicle for domestic and international communication in the 1930s and 40s? Only after the different historical circumstances were established was it fruitful to discuss what aspects of the photographs by Leni Riefenstahl, Hitler's photographer, might actually share with those by Dorothea Lange, who worked for the Resettlement Administration. Propagandistic art, or rather the role of artworks as ideological or political tools in 20th century Western culture, is an issue that emerges in a number of the papers on this panel. Examining art and cultural diplomacy from the Depression era to the present, the papers address perceptions of American culture abroad, as well as the cross-cultural commerce that has transpired between the United States, Japan, Italy, and other Western European countries. But the papers are not only about transnational cultural contact. They also suggest the social, political, and economic ramifications of such exchanges, or rather, they suggest what happens to the meaning of the art in question when American artists, museums, or governments offer or sell their cultures to other societies and nations. Our first speaker is Sergio Cortesini, a scholar from the University of Cassino in Italy, who will speak on a series of exhibitions of contemporary art that the Italian government sent to the United States in the 1930s. They were part of a propaganda campaign to offset the brutality of Mussolini's fascist dictatorship in the eyes of an American public. The second speaker is Helen Harrison, the director of the Pollock Krasner House and Study Center in East Hampton, New York, who will address Jackson Pollock's relationship to European modernism, focusing on the intercultural exchange between his work and pre- and post-war European abstraction. The third paper by John Bowles, a professor of art history at Indiana University, examines the postmodern practice of African-American artist Sanford Biggers, whose art engages Japanese youth culture's appropriation of hip hop as it deconstructs the global commodification of black culture. And finally, the fourth paper is delivered by Martha Bayless, a visiting fellow at the Aspen Institute in Berlin, who assesses the more successful aspects of US cultural policy in the Cold War, for which government agencies sent overseas a diversity of work created by liberal-minded artists. She asks if such a policy could exist today and speculates on what it might look like, given the cultural politics of the Bush administration and of the arts community, and I would add, given the new brand of anti-Americanism that has emerged abroad in recent years. So on this anticipatory note, I will turn the podium over to the speakers, and at the end of the session, I will ask a, a question or two, take questions from the audience, and then I believe Wanda Korn will be uh, wrapping up our symposium. Thank you. Thank you all. Ever since I came to Washington the first time as a doctoral student from the University of Rome, I also would like to thank my friend Jonathan uh, Waltz for sharing his friendship, his ideas, and for editing my Italianate English. And above all, I would like to thank you all for surviving to this very <laughs> last panel. In 1933, Mussolini's Social, social economic reforms and personal magnetism gained unprecedented sympathy in American public opinion. Quote, for this time in history, America is willing, for the first time in history, America is willing to welcome with open arms all that comes from, from Italy in terms of art, literature, and thought. With these considerations, young critic Dario Sabatello ended a report to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs returning from the US. In San Francisco, he had met Walter Heil, director of the Palace of the Legion of Honor, and enthralled him with the project of an exhibition of contemporary Italian art. Sabatello secured financial backing from his government, while Heil organized the circulation in museums of the Pacific Coast, greeting the event as an opportunity of better understanding between Italians and Americans, quote, through the eternal medium of the arts. Indeed, by the time the exhibition opened at the Legion of Honor in January 1935, 
the cultural undertaking was freighted with political implications. The Italian invasion of Ethiopia appeared that by then inevitable, and when this began, American public opinion had the reaction of offended innocence. Congress passed the Neutrality Act, inaugurating the isolationist policy unchanged until Pearl Harbor, and did not join 52 countries of the League of Nations in economic sanctions. In an effort to sustain the Neutralist Party and to restore the sympathy of layers of American society, the Italian government engineered a campaign of propaganda. Booklets overnumber contemporary issues mailed to politicians and journalists, lectures by Italian authors, the shipping of newsreels and documentaries, and exhibitions of contemporary art were part of this strategy. This country of high civilization and social reforms, and where the state was the greatest patron of the arts, how could it possibly be oppressed by the brutal regime depicted by the anti-fascists? The exhibition curated by Sabatello presented 90 paintings by 29 artists and circulated through May 1936 to San Francisco, Los Angeles, Portland, Seattle, Denver, St. Paul, Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, Memphis, Hagerstown, Maryland, Manchester, New Hampshire, New York, and St. Louis. In 1937, the Rome-based Comet Gallery opened a venue in New York and held eight group shows, including two in Detroit and Chicago. In 1939, the Italian government sent to the Golden Gate International Exposition a loan of masterpieces of Italian art and insisted on a parallel exhibition of contemporary art. The denouement of this political uh, cultural diplomacy was the Italian pavilion at the 1939 New York World's Fair and the participation in the International Women's Art Exhibit in New York in 1940. These initiatives contain three objectives. They affirmed a political value based on the assumption that art embodied the fascist Belt and Schaung, an aesthetic value in the presentation of an Italian school opposed to the Ecole de Paris, and a market value through the promotion of Italian artists to American collectors. The securing of a slice of the art market and the communication of an aesthetic instinct from the Parisian monopoly were two sides of the same coin and matched the confrontational policy of Italy as emerging power against France and Great Britain. In the exhibition catalog, Sabatello presented the standard critical discourse of the time. Contemporary art witnessed the recovery of the perennial values of Italian style, clarity, measure, and balance. Cubism and futurism proved transient efforts to get back to form against post-impressionism. But only the youngest artist recaptures the Mediterranean and Latin sense of volume and the structural quality of the composition. Italy had assisted to the dawn of a new era, consonant with the philosophical trends and political renewal of the time. The show presented few older futurists turned figurative, relatively known to the American public. The primitivist turn of Carlo Carrà toward human figures and simple volumes was exemplified by Bethers drawing themselves in, quote, a world at the beginning of time populated by primordial beings. Another former futurist, Gino Severini, showed his later cultural still lives, blending synthetic cubism with objects, archaeological fragments, theatrical masks, in a loosely pointyist brushwork. The Chirico presented his later subjects, such as the mysterious baths. Then, Sabatello deployed the youngest generation, such as Carlo Levi's expressionistic figures. However, the dominant, the dominant tone was given by the so-called Roman school. Gallery goers, 
would encounter puzzling narratives in almost abstract settings rendered in tunnelist arrangement of dim hues. The gestures of an improvised poet declaiming on a Tiber barge made uncanny by a nude under a drape reminiscent of Pompeian frescoes, or Alberto Ziveri's circle of nudes grieving over a death comrade as performing a tribal rite, or Emanuele Cavalli's woman coming out of a bath in the river in a landscape of paper mache rocks. Eschewing both futurism and fascist kitsch in style and reference to contemporary politics, Sabatello's selection was moderately modern. Was this a people dominated by youthful virility out of which Mussolini wanted to carve warriors? Propaganda is replaced by dreams, the art digest admitted. Yet, the dreamlike settings were no less political and lent themselves to convey fascist ethos in an oblique manner. While pursuing the classicizing values of light and architectures of colors, artists fashioned the alleged spiritual regeneration initiated by fascism. The buzzwords of primordium, dawn of a new era, and creation of modern myths echoed the rhetoric of the new man brought forth by the regime. Ostensibly aimed at submitting Italian works to American re reactions, the exhibition raised interest and ended up in being circulated by the College Art Association for 17 months instead of the four originally scheduled. However, the aspiration to make an impact in America was utopic. The estrangement from foreign styles, the urge to artists to relinquish deformity for realism, and the argument against the super salesmanship of French art were common to the advocates of the American scene and Italian critics. Yet, the Italian realism was a magical one, Sabatello admitted, and artists remain concerned with problems of aesthetics and genre counter to the environmentalism of American realism. On the other hand, enthusiastic with their quest for national style, Americans were no, not very receptive of another foreign model. More a wishful thinking than a monolithic style, Italian art was not easy categorized, is easily categorized, while the French paradigm was still key to the understanding of foreign art. With the exception of New York and San Francisco, a show of contemporary Italians was unprecedented. Faced with the novelty, local critics expressed appreciation, but in reviews recurred to a safe appraisal by mentioning the Parisian experience of the little known artists, reiterating the very patterns Italians wanted to eradicate. Further, the critical paradigm was also averted by Mussolini's encumbering celebrity. Sabatello himself had been presented by the Los Angeles Times as a personal friend of Mussolini's with whom he hardly had institutional relationships. Some critics held a sociological perspective, presenting the show as art under a dictator or a collection of works from the land of Il Duce. Other papers held it as an expression of Il Duce's own aesthetics. Premier Mussolini has shipped 90 Italian paintings for the Minneapolis Star. Mussolini's sponsorship of art shows striking results for the Los Angeles Times. Or so psychoanalytical implications in the perplexing supermodern paintings. Quote, these artists have received greatest encouragement from Mussolini. Their more, their more incompre incomprehensible works may provide an explanation of Il Duce's foreign policy, suspected the Hamilton Herald. Open at the eve of the Italian Ethiopian conflict, by the time the show arrived in St. Louis, Addis Ababa was in flames. American newspapers had covered daily the Italian aggression and the show could not shun politicized reviews. According to critics, Italian paintings was dreary because it was fascist. 
what Sabatello presented as magical realism appeared lifeless. Under the headline, New Fascist Art is Small and Inert, the outspokenly anti-fascist New York Post ridiculed, quote, the dismal little renaissance. This art, we are told, is one of the elements bearing witness to the rebirth of a people. Judging from it, they must have used plenty of chloroform. <laughs> Along the same line, Art Front published the best analysis of Italian art by an American observer of the time, Marxist critic Margaret Duroc, who denounced the very serene and archaistic quality of the pictures as evidence of fascist social control and maintenance of the status quo. To the contrary, the show was hailed as a selection of masterpieces, albeit ultra-modern and somehow shocking. The professor's Los Angeles examiner stressed the analogy here, uh, the analogy between fascism and artistic rebirth and praised the show as a message of peace amidst Europe's rumors of war. Reviews also illuminate the impact of art in different audiences. In Los Angeles, the public had, quote, turned thumbs down on modern art in general and Italian art in particular. The exhibition was deemed the most controversial of the past few years. It provoked discussions on degenerate art and vitriolic editorials, while the purchase of After the Bath by Carlo Carrà for the County Museum added strength to the uh, storm over Italian art, as the Evening Herald and Express reported. In Seattle, even in a modern art display, no one expected a stray pair of legs, like in Sabatello's Stairway, <laughs> which, quote, sent them, sent them hurrying off to ask any artist at hand just what the meaning of that was. Clusters of visitors discussing esoteric categories such as the fourth dimension caused the headline, art critic puzzled, and attached legs <laughs> in Italian paintings caused furor. Italian Americans, betrayed, Italian Americans betrayed mixed feelings of disappointment and compliance with their homeland. Their patriotic goodwill could hardly conceal the embarrassment for this so-called modern art. Quote, in Europe they became acquainted with that, but to us it may require much instruction and much study. By the way, we will receive it, as always, as a manifestation of faraway fatherland and will devote to it all the necessary time to grasp the beauties it undoubtedly must contain. In St. Paul, this show was uh, at the Minnesota State Fair, which by the mid-30s hosted the major artistic event of the state. The Italian pictures received more than 300,000 visitors. I would argue that precisely the rural and low-brow context of the fair may disclose the most fascinating intercultural terrain, where meaning constructed by Italian officials was reconfigured with the parameters, parameters of the local actors. The Minneapolis Journal published a photographic triptych. Two Italian lasses hold the laundresses by Emanuele Cavalli. Next to them, Minnesotan girls hold a landscape brought by the Public Works of Art project while a local artist looks at one of his canvases. In the Minneapolis Star, Italian girls direct the viewer's attention to an Italian painting, while an American girl examines a cityscape by a New York artist. Indeed, Italian pictures, quote, gathered at the request of Premier Mussolini, unquote, were hung next to a national selection of paintings done under the PWAP, a comparison between government's patronage in both countries, evoked by Sabatello and other critics, was finally possible. The Italian paintings had been circulating during the peak of regionalism, after Time magazine had devoted a cover story to the coming to the fore of the American scene by earthy Midwesterners. Opposed to, uh, opposed to outlandish French art. Even local artists had finally acknowledged that, quote, Minnesota country has always been paintable, unquote, and were producing unmannered painting, uh, 
quote, perhaps the renewed art activity around the Twin Cities is traceable to a land ho school originalism, but it shows that it was possible for artists living anywhere to paint what they know best. In handling artworks for the sake of the camera, the Italian lessons conform to the customary journalistic coverage of the fair, like numerous exhibitors striving for blue ribbons. Indeed, the Minnesota State Fair represents a mosaic-like collective self-portrait. It surveys and rewards the best produce, livestock, equipment, and the, and the variety of fellow countrymen. Art is an element of the taxonomy of the locale. For the Minneapolis Star, thousands of citizens will flock to the fairgrounds to view and the exhibits and show their appreciation of better hogs, better bread, and better oil painting, to mention only a few of the state assets. Presented to the fairgoers, the paintings of the Public Works of Art project were truly the expression of the people recommended by regionalists and federal administrators alike. Italian art could seem an intruder in this all-American pageant, but the Italian girls were dressed in a, in a traditional regional costumes, thus establishing an analogy along a regionalist pattern. Next to the, Italian, to the American scene, Italian art became folklore. The traditional dresses while assimilating contemporary Italian art to a domain comprehensible to the people, rather than to cognoscenti, recast it in an ethnic stereotype unauthorized by Italian critics. Interestingly, Italian art, foreign but representational, could be assimilated within a regionalist scheme, while other native artists were rejected. Twin, City, Twin Cities artist painters uh, Alexander Corazzo and Leroy Turner were dubbed a puzzle for the average man while they were given awards in Paris. Far away in cosmopolitan France was naturally capable of handling that esoteric art, while sons of Minnesota, such as Earl Loran, maintained that a red barn was as exciting a subject for painting as a Provencal mass. Meeting the spectrum of, Italian, of American audiences, the hammered artistic Italianness dissolved in a fluctuating, fluctuating intercultural terrain. The attempt to attract interest failed. The director of the Los Angeles County Museum hailed the purchase of the Carra as the first of a new modern Italian collection. The Venice Biennale's archives reveal a plan, unfortunately aborted, originated by post-surrealist Lorzel Feitelson for 10 Italian exhibitions in the Hollywood Gallery of Modern Art and a show of the newest American trends circulating in Italian cities devoted to movements ignored in Italy, the post-surrealist, the surrealist, the neoclassic, the expressionist, and the precisionists. But besides the limited efforts to connect artists across the Atlantic, Contemporary Italian art remained crushed between the myth of the Renaissance and French modernism. In 1939, Botticelli's Birth of Venus attracted more than three million visitors to San Francisco, Chicago, and the Museum of Modern Art in New York, confirming the stereotypical values of Italian art. The MoMA remained inaccessible to living Italian artists, not to Botticelli, until 1948, when it opened a major show of contemporary Italians. Then, James Strauss Sobey acknowledged some of the artists already shown in 1935 as champions of anti-fascist aesthetics during the 30s, what they did not necessarily mean to be and what remained unnoticed when they were received here as Mussolini's artists. Thank you. Forgive my redundancy for thanking the Smithsonian American Art Museum and the Terra Foundation for organizing this conference and for inviting me to participate. I'm also grateful to my colleagues here for their civil discourse, 
and to Edward Lenkin for helping me with an illustration. I've uh, reversed the order of the clauses in my title, as you can see, uh, because this is the order in which I'll be discussing the two aspects of my topic and because it makes a snappy slide. <laughs> when his 1942 painting, now known as Stenographic Figure, was included in the next year's Spring Salon for Young Artists, a juried exhibition at Peggy Guggenheim's New York City Gallery, Art of This Century, Jackson Pollock began to attract press attention. In The New Yorker, Robert Coates dismissed most of the show as amateurish, except for Pollock's abstract painting, as it was then called, with its curious reminiscences of both Matisse and Miro. This is the first, but by far the last, review to affirm American critics' recognition of Pollock's indebtedness to European modernism. Moreover, Pollock himself recognized and freely acknowledged it. According to his brother Charles, he knew a lot about European art and was aware of its importance in his own development. I'm quoting Charles here. After his first show at Art of This Century, the following November, the magazine Arts and Architecture asked Pollock for a statement. He opted instead to answer questions. His interviewer, say his biographers, Stephen Nafee and Gregory White Smith, was Robert Motherwell, who reportedly also helped him craft his replies. Asked if he thought it was important that many famous modern European artists are living in this country, Pollock answered yes, for they bring with them an understanding of the problems of modern painting. Referring specifically to the Surrealists, several of whom were also represented by Art of This Century, he continued, I am particularly impressed with their concept of the source of art being the unconscious. But his praise was tempered by a lack of enthusiasm for the art they produced. This idea interests me more than the specific painters do, he said, for the two artists I admire most, Picasso and Miro, are still abroad. Unlike the Surrealists, Picasso and Miro appealed to Pollock as painters, so it was not necessary for either artist actually to show up in person. Their works were highly visible at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, which opened shortly before he moved to that city in 1930. MoMA's 1939 survey, Picasso, 40 Years of His Art, and Pollock owned the catalog to this exhibition, so being as poor as he was at the time, it must have taken considerable resources for him to purchase it, uh, in which Guernica was prominently displayed, and its 1941 Miro retrospective came at a pivotal time in Pollock's development. The impact of these two major shows is clearly reflected in his work. The Matisse connection perceived by Coates is less obvious. In her monograph on Pollock, Ellen Landau asserts that before the early 1940s, he was not at all interested in the work of Matisse. In stenographic figure, however, she allows that some subtle echoes may be recognized, especially in the color palette and the open schematic composition. She credits Lee Krasner, whose relationship with Pollock began in early 1942, with encouraging him to take Matisse seriously. In the Arts and Architecture interview, published in February 1944, as responses to a questionnaire, Motherwell took pains to establish Pollock's roots in the American West, and how that background, the horizontality of the land, and what Pollock called the basic universality of vision, and essentially Western colors of American Indian art, affected his work. He also asked Pollock, have you traveled any? I've knocked around some in California, some in Arizona, he replied, never been to Europe. Nor did he feel any desire to go abroad. As he put it, I don't see why the problems of modern painting can't be solved as well here as elsewhere. His reasoning was based on the conviction that the basic problems of contemporary painting are independent of any one country. In this view, Pollock was hardly alone. Most of the nascent New York school were of the same opinion and were drawing on similar sources. 
The problem was how to advance beyond what the Europeans had already achieved. By 1947, when Pollock's work was first exhibited overseas, it was evident that his European predecessors still loomed large in his background. Responding to the very brief appearance of one of his paintings in a group show in England that September, the critic Clement Greenberg described Pollock as <laughs> a morbid and extreme disciple of Picasso's Cubism and Miro's post-Cubism, tinctured also with Kandinsky and surrealist inspiration. Although he dubbed him the most powerful painter in contemporary America, Greenberg clearly did not feel that Pollock had outgrown his apprenticeship to the European masters. That situation, however, was about to change. In the spring of 1948, Peggy Guggenheim was invited to exhibit her collection of modern art at the 24th Venice Biennale. In addition to important examples by European abstractionists and surrealists, she owned numerous works by young Americans, including nearly two dozen Pollocks, which she had acquired as his dealer and patron. After closing Art of This Century the previous year, she resumed her pre-war life as an expatriate socialite and decided to settle in Venice. But while searching for a suitable home, she was obliged to leave her collection in storage in New York. As she recalled in her memoir, Out of This Century, Confessions of an Art Addict, the Biennale's secretary general learned that she wanted to bring the collection to Venice and offered her the use of the Greek pavilion, which would be vacant that year. The exhibition included six works by Pollock. The selection on, focused on his figure-based abstractions, including circumcision and the moon woman, full of distorted forms and cryptic symbolism. Although she assured her memoir's readers that her exhibition had enormous publicity and the pavilion was one of the most popular at the Biennale, none of the press coverage was devoted to Pollock. The following spring, excuse me, the following spring, the exhibition, now including 10 of his works, traveled to Florence and Milan. But again, there is no indication that Pollock impressed the Italian critics favorably or otherwise. But this was his first exposure in Europe and paved the way for two highly significant shows in Italy in 1950. And I want to thank Sergio for setting this up for me. <laughs> At that year's 25th Venice Biennale, two small poured paintings by Pollock, which you see here on the screen, and one major canvas, number one, 1948, also known as number one A, 1948, due to an inventory misnumbering, were included in the exhibition at the official United States Pavilion. <clears throat> Pollock, Willem de Kooning, and the late Arshel Gorky represented modern American painting with what Time magazine characterized as wild and woolly abstractions that got silent treatment from the critics. Presumably, Time was referring to the Italian critics, for various American writers discussed the show in print, and it was reviewed in the British Broadcasting Corporation's magazine, The Listener. In the New York Times, Aline B. Lockheim contradicted Time's report, suggesting it would be more accurate to say that um, rather than ignoring American art, European critics do not bother to give our pavilion very serious consideration, and that even the most intelligent of them spent little time looking at Gorky and de Kooning. She pointed out, however, that the response to Pollock was quite different especially regarding his controversial painting technique. I'm quoting her now. His detailed description of how he works, dripping paint, etc., onto canvas spread on the floor, has been assiduously translated and is grounds for violent arguments pro and con all abstract and automatic art. The description had originally appeared in the single issue of Possibilities, a journal subtitled Problems of Contemporary Art published in the winter of 1947-48. Pollock's statement outlined an approach radically at odds with prevailing practice, even the most advanced European modernism. Although formulated before his pouring method had fully matured, and the painting you see illustrated here is obviously an example of that uh, pre-pouring uh, style, it made clear his fundamental iconoclasm 
Perhaps the most unorthodox was his rejection of de the deliberate formal analysis and structural decision making that underlie traditional pictorial composition. When I am in my painting, I am not aware of what I'm doing, he maintained. It is only after a sort of get acquainted period that I see what I have been about. Ideas and practices like these were bound to stimulate debate among a European vanguard, cut adrift from the pre-war modernist mainstream in search of a new impetus. According to the American art dealer, Catherine Viviano, who visited the Biennale, young Italian painters were tremendously excited by Pollock's three paintings and recognized immediately what a great artist he was. Those are her words. Even some Italian, established Italian painters were favorably impressed. When the founder of spatialism, Lucio Fontana, the former futurist, Gino Severini, and the still life painter, Giorgio Morandi, visited the United States Pavilion together, Morandi reportedly surveyed the display with reservations until he spotted number one, 1948. Now this is new, he declared. Such vitality, such energy. Morandi's art was not noticeably influenced by this encounter, but it may well, <laughs> no, I would say not. Um, <clears throat> but it may well have contributed to Severini's return to abstraction after decades as a representational painter. Fontana's commitment to art as a function of new techniques and new means, as he has, had declared in his 1947 spatial manifesto, was certainly affirmed as were the forebodings of those who saw Pollock's approach as nihilistic. In Fontana's view, which Pollock's work seemed to support, the post-war sensibility was expressed in attacks on the canvas itself. A newly won liberty waits for us, Fontana predicted, but just as obviously, the end of art waits for us as well. To coincide with the Biennale, a trio of art promoters known as Le Tre Mani, the Three Hands, offered to sponsor a more comprehensive presentation of Pollock's work from Peggy Guggenheim's collection. She had recently moved into an eccentric palazzo on the Grand Canal, which was a private venue for her collection as a whole, but here was an opportunity to showcase her Pollocks at the Museo Correr in a highly visible public location opposite the San Marco Cathedral, this is a photograph taken of it in 2002 when there was an effort to recreate that exhibition. That show comprised all of her 23 Pollocks, including two she had donated to the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, but borrowed back for the occasion. Among the major works were Full Fathom Five, Enchanted Forest, and Alchemy. Thousands of people saw this exhibition, she recalled with evident satisfaction. It was lit at night, and I remember the extreme joy I had sitting in the Piazza San Marco, beholding the Pollocks glowing through the open windows of the museum. And according to Guggenheim, all the young painters were very much influenced by this show. Le Tremani produced a catalog with a critical essay, and I hope I'm pronouncing this correct, correctly, Sergio, you can tell me if I'm not, Guazzabugli, D. Jackson Pollock, by one of the three hands, the young critic Bruno Alfieri. The essay, its title referring to a literary character known for making a mess, had previously appeared in an Italian journal, L'Arte Moderna, in which the translation of Pollock's possibilities statement was also published. Guggenheim's memoir is curiously silent on Alfieri's contribution, but when she financed a second printing of the catalog, the essay was eliminated. As B.H. Friedman noted, it was not hard to understand why. Although Alfieri concluded that Pollock was, quote, the modern painter who sits at the extreme apex of the most advanced and unprejudiced avant-garde of modern art, and that compared to him, poor Pablo Picasso was a quiet conformist, a painter of the past, he also insisted that Pollock's art could not be judged by conventional measures of structure, style, or content. Jackson Pollock's paintings represent absolutely nothing, he declared. No facts, no ideas, no geometrical forms. As he saw it, Pollock's art was chaotic. Moreover, it expressed only, in his words, pieces of Pollock, 
and that Alfieri wondered whether the painter's inner world was indeed worth knowing. Damn it, he complained. If I must judge a painting by the artist, it is no longer a painting that I'm interested in. I no longer care about the formal values contained in it. Pollock received a copy of the essay, and although neither he nor Krasner could read Italian, they understood and relished the reference to povero Picasso. <laughs> but it also furnished plenty of ammunition for Pollock's detractors, among them Time Magazine's critic, Alexander Elliott. And I apologize for the abysmal copy of this article. Never one to miss an opportunity to coin or repeat a negative phrase about Pollock's work, Eliot ran a column in Times November 20th, 1950 issue under the confrontational heading, Chaos Damn It, that included a lengthy quote from Alfieri. It read in part, it is easy to detect the following in all of his Pollock's paintings. Chaos, absolute lack of harmony, complete lack of structural organization, Total absence of technique, however rudimentary. Once again, chaos. Time also stated that Pollock had followed his canvases to Italy. In fact, he never left the United States. But if we accept Alfieri's assertion that the true content of Pollock's art was the psyche of the artist himself, a notion confirmed by Krasner, who said that her husband believed that he and his work were one and the same, it could be said that he was, with his paintings, wherever they went. Pollock could not fail to resent Time's unflattering excerpts of Alfieri's article. So far, this was the longest of the magazine's regular put-downs of his work, and he felt that it warranted a reply. Possibly reasoning that a brief message would stand a better chance of finding its way into print, which indeed it did, he and Krasner decided to send a telegram to the editor. According to Pollock's biographer, Jeffrey Potter, the couple spent hours at the kitchen table composing a succinct rebuttal. No chaos, damn it, was the lead sentence, followed by a clever plug, damned busy painting, as you can see by my show coming up November 28th. They also took the opportunity to correct Eliot's mistake about his visit to Italy. And obviously stung by Time's failure to quote any favorable comments, they closed with, think you left out most exciting part of Mr. Alfieri's piece. In 34 words, honed and polished by the articulate Krasner, Pollock had challenged his detractors to confront the work directly at his forthcoming exhibition, and as Alfieri had suggested, not to judge it by conventional standards. How then was Pollock's art to be judged? Alfieri's insistence that it must be measured against the character of its creator implies that the persona is manifest in the work, even when the artist is not physically present. It also requires us to know and evaluate the man, and that has clearly been the prevailing current in much of the writing on Pollock. Those like Greenberg, who have tried to impose a formalist analysis, have generally lost out to sociological, behavioral, psychological, existential, and kinesthetic arguments. Pollock the Romantic, Pollock the Cowboy flinging lariats of paint, Pollock the quintessential American primitive, Pollock the heavyweight champion in the action painter's arena, Pollock the explosive spirit of the atomic age, Pollock manifesting his inner conflicts on the canvas, Pollock the dancer, acrobat, shaman, method actor, these characterizations have all but overwhelmed Pollock, the artist. For in spite of his complicated nature, it's easier to come to terms with Pollock as a person than with Pollock as a painter. Alfieri seems to have sensed this, for to him, the art appeared to be about nothing, nothing that is except the artist himself. Its form, structure, and content were so different from what even the avant-garde was then involved with that Alfieri simply couldn't see them. Pollock didn't merely break with convention. He went beyond the most unconventional alternatives the Europeans had yet devised. Instead of chipping away at the stumbling blocks of cubism, futurism, and surrealism, he had vaulted over them into uncharted territory. No wonder, then, that his work provoked young European artists to question the very basis of abstract aesthetics. I'd like to end with a little epilogue. By the time of Pollock's death, his work was widely known and appreciated in Europe. 
During the preceding five years, it had been exhibited in Amsterdam, Barcelona, Belgrade, Bern, Brussels, Dusseldorf, Frankfurt, The Hague, Helsinki, London, Milan, Oslo, Paris, Stockholm, and Vienna and Zurich. According to his friend and fellow artist Philip, uh, Fritz Bultmann, Pollock received much more real understanding in Europe. The painters there were more shook by his work, realizing its importance. Another who agreed was the painter Paul Jenkins, who divided his time between New York and Paris, and still does. In 1955, concerned about Pollock's loss of creative momentum and deepening despondency, Jenkins urged him to visit France, <clears throat> excuse me, where he would be hailed as a great master. Evidently, Pollock decided to accept the offer, and he and Krasner both took out passports. Early the following year, however, he met a young aspiring artist named Ruth Kligman, whose hero worship and sexual favors were understandably more appealing to him than the prospect of confronting the European art world on its own turf. As his affair with Kligman progressed, his marriage deteriorated, and he opted out of the trip abroad. In July 1956, Krasner sailed for Europe alone. On August 12th, she was in Jenkins's Paris apartment when Clement Greenberg telephoned with the news that Pollock had been killed in a car crash the previous night. I can't help but wonder how things would have turned out for him if he had gone to Europe with Krasner. Thank you. And the title of my talk today is African American Culture in Japan, History and Transnational Dialogue. In 2003, at a Zen Buddhist temple in Japan, African American artist Sanford Biggers held a memorial service he called Hip Hop Ni Sasagu in memory of hip hop. Sixteen participants, including the artist, his Japanese friends, and the temple master, participated in a ritual of structured improvisation ringing the sort of prayer bells that Japanese families keep at home for Buddhist and Shinto rituals commemorating their ancestors. In the summer of 2004, Biggers exhibited a video documenting the memorial service at, at the Cincinnati Contemporary Arts Center, along with one of the bells. Some of the bells had belonged to the temple. The rest, like this one here, Biggers commissioned specifically for the event. A second video in Cincinnati documented how Japanese craftsmen cast these from hip-hop jewelry the artist had purchased in Japan. The two videos and the bell demonstrate the artist's fascination with the way Japanese youth have adopted the stylings of hip-hop. Significantly, Biggers does not assume that he can assess what hip-hop means for the Japanese, nor does he dismissively remark upon the inability of the Japanese to understand hip-hop's value for African Americans, as most American observers do. Instead, he addresses the fascination Japanese youth have for hip hop culture as evidence of both the exploitation of black culture and a diasporic form of community building that implies resistance and survival. His memorial service registers feelings of loss at the hands of globalization while simultaneously establishing the possibility for transnational communication and solidarity with the Japanese friends he invited to participate. He offers an alternative to commodification by self-consciously blending a lay appreciation of Zen Buddhism with hip-hop's participatory aesthetic. As a result, he lays claim to both and infuses them with the meaning they risk losing in the global marketplace. Biggers develops hip-hop's ethos of participation and community building into a critique, if not quite a condemnation, of the global commodification of black culture. Bigger's Buddhist ceremony also demonstrated a reciprocal interest in Asian culture, and if the artist demonstrates an Orientalist perspective, he does so strategically, implicating the Japanese participants in the appropriation of their own culture. Hip hop ni sasagu provo provokes a Brechtian distanciation and establishes a moral conundrum that Biggers has explored in a number of artworks, asking implicitly whether cultural exchange can occur without exploitation. Bigger's ceremony can be understood as an attempt to establish transnational dialogue on the basis of a shared culture, taking advantage of what music critic Greg Tate describes as hip hop's global ubiquity. Tate calls on blacks to maintain worldwide solidarity through the medium of hip hop, 
a feat he laments that no one has yet accomplished. Biggers initiates an exchange, but not with black specifically, but with Japanese youth. Biggers has also made artworks that identify hip hop with cultures of the African diaspora. I don't have time to discuss these today, but these two streams in his work mean understanding hip hop as hybrid and in historically particular ways. Thus, Biggers' artworks that address Japanese fascination with hip hop draw on a century long history of political solidarity and cultural exchange between African Americans and Japan. At the same time, Biggers' works ask viewers to consider whether both Japanese and African American hip hop fans are culpable for the commodification and exploitation of black culture. It has long been acknowledged that African American artists draw upon traditions of Africa and the diaspora, as well as from experiences abroad as visitors to France or the Caribbean or to Africa, for example. New global contexts are being sought for American art, but is an ever more detailed historical account sufficient? What I propose is not only the consideration of new influences, but new ways to understand those that, that scholars have already recognized. Historians have recently focused attention on the, on the relationship between African Americans and Asians, both as a move to situate American studies within a global context and to consider black politics and culture within a broader anti-colonialist and internationalist project. The most promising approach to what historians Robin Kelly and Vijay Prashad call a polycultural perspective on history regards identity as contingent and provisional, always engaged at the convergence of a multiplicity of historical forces and lineages. For example, writer Joe Wood has provided a model for understanding the mutual fascination between uh, African Americans and, and the Japanese in his account of a research visit to study Japanese attitudes towards African American culture, and particularly those of the Japanese hip hop fans who darken their faces and style their hair in cornrows or afros in an attempt to look black. Throughout his account, Wood remains self-reflexive. He documents Japanese racism toward blacks, but also allows himself to wonder about the value of what he's learned. Wood concludes his article with a visit to a sento, or public bath, where he owns up to his touristic fascination with what he refers to as the truly Japanese. Having come to study who, the, the people he calls the Yellow Negro of Japan, at the end of the article, he instead recognizes himself as, as he puts it, the black-faced Japanese in the mirror. Wood's essay, like Bigger's artwork, asks whether transnational exchange requires exoticizing the other or even oneself. Neither Bigger's nor Wood provides a solution, but both perform their interest in Japan self-reflexively. Bigger's in particular poses the question of whether to participate in Japanese culture, he must make himself available to the racial desires of his friends. What happens when hip hop comes to Japan? His answer recognizes its place in consumer culture, but takes advantage of this to build coalitions, to communicate with Japanese youths who believe themselves as deeply invested in hip hop as biggers, but who respond to it differently from the perspective of particular Japanese conditions. Biggers acknowledges hip hop's appeal to foreign audiences and addresses this as an opportunity with generosity to take advantage of a common youth culture to initiate dialogue. People are not only gaining access to hip hop, he says, they are searching for ideas, change, community, hope, respect. Like Tate, he sees hip hop's global dissemination as an opportunity to engage hip hoppers like Japanese DJ Crush, who says that because of his involvement in hip hop since the 80s, as he says, I've certainly gotten into more of my Japanese roots. For some of hip hop's Japanese fans, the culture's emphasis on authenticity provides a bulwark against the homogenizing effects of global consumerism. DJ Crush, for example, tells a sort of coming of age story about Japanese hip hop, arguing that as Japanese fans have learned about black culture through hip hop, they've begun to create their own viable underground culture. Bigger's response is to make work that is, as he puts it, about communicating to receptive individuals from any background via available and somehow familiar signifiers. The funeral Biggers staged in Japan mourns hip hop's passing into the globalized culture, but in the process he makes of it something vitally new. His ceremony at the Zen temple arranged with the assistance of the temple master 
was sensitive to Japanese culture and to the Buddhist and Shinto beliefs of the ceremony's participants. By embracing Buddhism, Biggers asks further questions about the capacity for global exchange through sharing. Biggers' use of a Buddhist ceremony required his Japanese participants to consider the, con, to consider the ramifications of intercultural exchange. When he asks, how will people in Japan relate to an African American taking them through a Buddhist ceremony? Will they relate? His questions imply that his Japanese friends reciprocate by pondering the ethics of their enthusiasm for hip hop, by asking themselves what it is that attracts them to hip hop. To what extent are they culpable for exploiting black culture once again? Biggers appropriates Japanese culture to investigate the Japanese fascination with hip hop, but he involves his Japanese friends in the process from the planning stages through the work's execution, and so creates the opportunity for the Japanese to teach him about Japanese culture and arrive at something new together. Is hip hop global culture? Biggers' artworks establish dialogue with the Japanese by asking after their commitment to hip hop culture. How do they understand it? Does their fascination amount to anything more than exploitation? Bigger's work also confronts American viewers with the question of who bears responsibility for the popularity of black culture in Japan, and what, to what extent this has to do with the reciprocal taste for Japanese culture. In Donpatsu, another video Bigger's exhibited with hip hop Nisasugu in Cincinnati, the artist retells the story of Samson and Delilah within the structure of a sumo retirement ceremony. Danpatsu is the Shinto rit ritual when a wrestler's peers and supporters mark the end of his competitive career by cutting off his top knot, the traditional sumo hairstyle. In Bigger's video, the artist meditates in the autumn woods with eyes closed, dressed in a hakata, the Shinto clothing Japanese men wear for formal occasions. The video has a peaceful and solemn quality enhanced by the soundtrack which is simply the sound of birds chirping and leaves blowing in the breeze. A Japanese woman wearing a kimono approaches Biggers from behind, cuts his dreadlocks, and then shaves his head. A brief close-up of her hand holding the razor reveals that she wears a hip-hop ring. Has Japanese culture and its enthusiastic appropriation of hip-hop metaphorically shorn black culture of its roots, figured prominently in the video by Biggers' dreadlocks? <laughs> made during a residency in Japan at a moment when Biggers says his experiences made him wonder for the first time whether he had become a Buddhist, I find another possibility. Is this Biggers' way of asking whether cultural exchange necessitates exoticization and commodification? Black culture has popularly been figured as masculine and Asian culture as feminine. Danpatsu poses these conventions as questions. Must Biggers relinquish his dreadlocks in exchange for the Japanese culture and beliefs figured by his clothing? He offers no resistance when the actress cuts his hair. Instead, he sits passively throughout the video, granting his tacit consent. If, like Samson, Biggers' hairstyle represents his strength and the salvation of his people, as Rastafarians believe, what weakness causes him to submit? Has he been seduced by Asian culture, which the video figures as hybrid? The Japanese woman's hip-hop ring signals her appropriation of blackness, disrupting the image of Jap Japanese tradition that her kimono creates. It seems that the artist and the woman are, are each willing to sacrifice something of their difference as a gesture toward mutual commitment. Bigger's video is not about resignation, therefore, but the quandary of participation in global culture, what must be relinquished in order to embrace the other, and what must be made available for exchange. Rastafarian spirituality and hip hop represent two distinct models for the globalization of black culture, and both are popular in Japan. Is Bigger's Cincinnati exhibition, in, in Bigger's Cincinnati exhibition, the artist placed hip hop within a tradition of African expressive practices, as well as a history of political and cultural exchange between African Americans and Japan, including the, Afri the Japanese influence on African American youth culture. To do this, Biggers made reference to earlier manifestations of post-war black culture that have had a profound influence on hip hop, including jazz and black martial arts movies that became popular in part through Americans' long-standing fascination with Asian culture. In hip hop Ni Sasagu, Biggers organized 16 participants into four circles for a structured musical improvisation. Each participant was given a bell, and according to certain rules, it was up to the individual to decide when to ring it. 
Biggers has explained his composition in terms of jazz improvisation. In the context of a Zen Buddhist ritual, it recalls the interrelated popularity of jazz and Zen in post-war American culture, an enthusiasm that united blacks and whites for a time in the countercultural beat poetry of Leroy Jones, Allen Ginsberg, and Jack Kerouac. This legacy might also serve as a cautionary tale, however, considering how the black-white cultural coalition unraveled in debates about white Negroes, black cultural nationalism, organized politics, and the paradoxical ease with which dissent can become commodified. Biggers even raises questions about the supposed spontaneity of Zen Buddhism, a, a quality central to its reception in America. He told an interviewer recently that while making hip hop ni sasagu, the Japanese participants would say we could never improvise, but this improvisational project worked and they were impro improvising effortlessly. What caused it to succeed? Biggers universalizes the result, saying that he and his friends were meditating together to the point that each individual lost his or her sense of self and experienced instead an engagement with the world that Biggers calls fundamental. Biggers' perspective is not ahistorical, however. He regards the participatory experience of hip hop as a means for grounding experience in the particular realities of the moment as these are inflected by tradition whether in his Zen memorial service or in the breakdancing competitions for which he and another artist, David Ellis, have made mandala-like rubber dance mats. And you see on the right a photograph, a still from a video that Sanford Biggers and Davis, David Ellis made of a breakdance competition using one of their rubber dance mats. Is hybridity the new authenticity? Black Belt Jones, work on the left, Biggers' portrait of 1970s black exploitation and karate movie star Jim Kelly in his most famous role provides a key to the artist's Cincinnati exhibition, which he optimistically titled Both And, Not Either Or. Biggers made the work by reproducing a publicity photo of Kelly in the title role of the 1974 film Black Belt Jones in grains of Indonesian black rice and American long grain white rice glued to paper. The rice articulates the interrelatedness of African-American and Asian cultures. It is a food historically important to both due to pre-modern forms of intercontinental trade between Africa and Asia. But it also refers to the trade in enslaved Africans, many of whom were brought forci forcibly from West Africa's rice coast to work North American's rice plantations. In 1974, the same year Kelly's film was released, Historian Peter Wood proposed that the early economic success of Carolina's rice plantations was due to enslaved Africans' knowledge about the cultivation of rice, knowledge that the English settlers certainly lacked. Since then, historians have developed this theory to argue for the importance of enslaved Africans as active participants in the economy and the economic history of the U.S., despite the violent depredations of the Middle Passage and North American slavery establishing in part their role in America's emergence within global mo uh, modernity. In, Bligger, in, in Bigger's Black Belt Jones, history makes an odd circle, from the colonial trade in rice and slaves to the revolutionary promise karate movies once held for young blacks, movies that continue to inspire young hip hoppers, to articulate a common heritage defined by commerce, culture, and conflict. Prashad argues that in the 70s, some black youths understood Asian martial arts in terms of the black power movement's call for self-determination, modeled in part on the Viet Cong's anti-imperialist war against a common enemy. The solidarity that Biggers Black Belt Jones articulates was the result of a self-consciously politicized response to a history of exploitation and oppression, one that found momentary expression in, a, in popular culture through the genre of films some derided at the time as black exploitation. Is such solidarity possible today? Can it be reclaimed by reminiscence? I find in Bigger's work an alternative to the two predominant mo models of globalization, Samuel Huntington's clash of civilizations versus the homogenizing McDonaldization of corporatized culture. The first model cynically assumes that communication and exchange are impossible, and the second that culture travels in one direction only. Neither model provides a way to close the circle. Can the global circulation of African-American culture establish dialogue and solidarity with cultures abroad? Biggers takes a critical view of cultural hybridity. Rather than assume that hip hop's global popularity is necessarily good or bad, he acknowledges the ancillary costs inherent in making one's culture available, as well as the possibilities this creates, 
for establishing a momentary and contingent globalized culture of resistance. The implication is that the worldwide commercialization of some black and Asian traditions has not shorn them of liberatory potential, but that their future lies in how each is valued in the present. Thank you. This is the panel with four people on it. But I see there are quite a few survivors out there. It's like the movie Ninochka when Greta Garbo arrives in Paris and she's asked by, uh, I'm forgetting the actor's name, how are things going back home, comrade Tovarich Ninochka? And she says, oh, the purges are going very well. We have fewer but better Russians. <laughs> So we have fewer but better participants. Yeah. Um, um, I want to thank Wanda Korn and the Terra Foundation and the museum for inviting me to speak. I'm tickled to be here. Uh, this is a really interesting conference. Enough said. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of pictures up here because I changed my talk a little bit toward the end here. And I have two images which I'll bore you with. Um, but I wanted to do a kind of slightly redactor thing with my fellow panelists up here, all of whose uh, talks were really interesting to me. And so I couldn't do that and plan to have pictures a uh, month ahead. So I won't try to be a redactor for the whole conference. That's quite beyond me. But I will try to comment on my previous, this previous speakers a little bit in order, as a way of getting in my own two licks about um, the subject of this panel, which is culture, commerce, and propaganda, I would add to that list diplomacy, because I think there is a legitimate place for culture in diplomacy, um, but the question of how can it be legitimate is really the topic of my talk. I'll move that a little bit. <clears throat> okay. Uh, the three speakers before me, um, Oh, uh, let's see, my first image. This is an image of the current state of American cultural diplomacy. <laughs> this is the America House in Berlin, not far from the Zoo uh, U-Bahn stop in that very busy uh, downtown area near the Kudam. And uh, as you can see, it wasn't a beautiful building to start with, uh, but now it's considered an architectural gem worth preserving, and for, but nobody knows what to do with it. It's completely shut down. It's, very, very unfriendly to any attempt to learn anything about it. And this is very sad for Berliners because this used to be a place, a meeting place for all sorts of things, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. <clears throat> uh, so just there, there are sort of three themes that came out, I think, in, the, in my predecessor's talks up here. So let me summarize them briefly and then address them um, in the light of what America did during the Cold War and in the light of the thinking that is rather prevalent here in Washington these days that in the Cold War we did it right and now given our current crisis we need to, the current crisis of America's image in the world, we need to somehow do what we did during the Cold War. I want to address that, uh, that thinking. Um, the first is of course Professor Cortesini's uh, really interesting discussion of the Italian exhibitions that came over here in the 30s. I guess the point I'd make about that is I, what I found utterly fascinating was how uh, clearly that was an attempt to sort of split the difference between modernism and socialist realism, the futurists having been uh, disciplined by then, even though they were, of course, enthusiastic about Mussolini earlier in the century and during World War I. Uh, at this point, they had been put in their place, as had the modernists in, in Soviet Russia, who had been enthusiastic about that revolution. Um, so that whole question of the avant-garde and its uses in cultural diplomacy is very interesting. Professor Harrison's talk um, is interesting because it holds up a kind of model of cultural interaction and cultural influence that seems to take place really quite apart from the meddling of governments and the intentions of governments. Um, I assume that Pollock was caught up in the attempts to use abstract expressionism as, an ex as a form of cultural diplomacy during the Cold War. Um, but what she's talking about is something that's taking place really in the realm of art and not 
and not being commandeered by government for any uh, particular purpose. So that's a sort of, sort of second model. But unlike the futurists and unlike the constructivists and other, model, other modernists in Soviet Russia or during the early Bolshevik period, um, the, avant the avant-gardism of Jackson Pollock was not tied to a radical political and social project. Uh, there was that old link, that pre-World War I link between revolution in art and revolution in society uh, seems not to, to prevail in this kind of cultural exchange. Um, and finally, uh, John Bowles is really interesting discussion of the hip hop Japan connection, which has intrigued me for a long time. Um, here you have, as he puts it, um, basically a, a kind of two ways of looking at what is a commercialized form of popular culture. On the one hand, it's the exploitative side where it becomes a, commod a commodified product, which I would say is not always a bad thing, but in the case of hip hop in recent years, I would say definitely it has been a bad thing. Um, because of the nature of what has been done to uh, the humanity of, 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 black, of black Americans by the, their depiction in a lot of commercial hip hop. I could go on about that for 20 minutes easily, but I won't. Um, but this, this sort of, but the, the hip hop is something else, of course, in its origins, uh, both in the West Indies and in the United States, it was always a community-based um, kind of politically engaged form of, of, of improvised culture, I'll put it that way. And in that sense, it's spread around the world is quite interesting. Um, now, let me just pause and say, in the current situation that the United States finds itself in, um, it would be very foolish to suggest that the unpopularity of the Bush administration's policies, the way it has been conducting the war on terror, the treatment of prisoners, uh, and of course, um, well, the rest of the whole ball of wax, it would be very foolish to suggest that some sprinkling of cultural pixie dust is going to change people's minds around the world. Pro you know, these policies are, loom very large in people's minds. They're much more important than culture. And people have said over and over again in international opinion surveys that they like American culture, they just don't like American government policy. And that's kind of the conventional wisdom. But I would suggest, I have, t I have a long argument, which I'm not going to have time to lay out today, that there is a growing alienation in the world from American culture, and particularly popular culture, because of the way popular culture has changed and evolved, well, not evolved, I would say devolved, um, in the last uh, decade or two or three. Um, but that's a complicated argument, which I'm just going to kind of sit over here on the shelf. Um, but I do think that the lack of you know, the coarseness and the violence and the, the sort of sniggering exploitative sexuality of American pop culture, of a great deal of it, is a really bad ambassador of the US. And in places in the world where people from very socially conservative societies know nothing about the US except what they're getting off of the satellite TV. I think that's a problem and that's what I'm investigating for my book. So no pixie dust. Um, but on the other hand, I do think cultural diplomacy is extremely important. And I also would make an argument that there should be some government support and involvement of it. Um, but that's, that's when things get really tricky and that's sort of what I want to focus on in the rest of my remarks. Um, let me go back to these three talks and try to make three points related to them. Um, first of all, the use of the avant-garde. Um, it puts me in mind of the attempts by the USIA uh, to make abstract expressionism a symbol of freedom during the 50s uh, and, you know, moderately successful attempts. Um, and that has come under scrutiny lately as uh, a kind of very compromised use of that art form. And in fact, I think to the, to the degree that the scrutiny has been a hostile scrutiny, it has begun to redound against abstract expressionism, that somehow this uh, style of art, this genre of art, these artists allowed themselves to be used not just by the USIA, but by the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which, as we all know, was covertly funded by the CIA, and it gets more and more ominous sounding. And um, there's a sense in which this is, as your students in Hamburg would probably suggest, no different from the social policies of the Third Reich. <laughs> 
<clears throat> now that's really interesting to me because I see some differences, big differences, between the social policies of the Third Reich and the use of abstract expressionism by the, even by the Congress of Culture for Cultural Freedom. First of them would be that um, the abstract expressionists were not in a committed, well, the main reason, I'll just stick with this one difference. Um, they were not in a committed ideological alliance with the US government. Most of the abstract expressionists, their politics were quite leftist. Um, what they were generally, although some of them weren't particularly political at all, but my sense of their political caste is that they were um, sort of warmed over Trotskyists. You know, they, they supported socialism. They weren't a big fan of the US government. Uh, they weren't a big fan of capitalism, um, but they were anti-Stalinist, and they were pro-modernist. So in that sense, in the old Popular Front battle, they would have taken the Trotskyist side, and they would have defended modernism hand-in-hand hand with socialism. That was where s at least some of them placed their politics, the more politically aware. And this is, I think, highly significant for us today. I seem to be pushing this podium off the t stage. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> It's because there's a mismatch between where this thing is and where I am. Well, I'll just lean on it. I'll try not to push it onto you. Um, <laughs> thank you. I wouldn't have dreamed. Um, okay. Well, all these other people are tall. I don't know why they didn't have a problem. But, um, okay. Um, yeah. Um, in that sense, the abstract expressionists, and many of those who admired them in, in, in Europe, um, were part of what was known in those days as the non-communist left. And that's a phrase that I think is highly significant in Cold War diplomacy. I'll say why in a minute. Now we have Pollock. Um, this model, which I'm sort of, perhaps I'm distorting what, you're, what you'd said, but the sense that of a kind of cultural influence is taking place without being politicized or without being commandeered by government um, was very important during the Cold War. Unfortunately, it was kind of hard for it to happen because of the extreme controls that were put on cultural exchange by the Soviet government and by the governments of most Eastern European countries. There were times when things slipped back and forth rather freely, thaws, Prague Springs, uh, and of course, Perestroika and Glasnost eventually. Um, but what's interesting about this sort of unsupervised cultural exchange in the Cold War was the Soviet influence on the US. One of the things I've learned um, is that the performing arts troops that came over here, particularly the dance troops, had an enormous impact on the United States. I don't think this was the intention of the Soviet government to enrich the performing arts in the US. Um, but that's what they did. Uh, huge rise in interest in dance because of the Russian dance troops. Huge rise in regional theater and theater because of Moscow Art Theater. Um, the impact in performing arts, which is of course where the Russians were strongest, much stronger than visual art under Stalin, needless to say. Um, not that they were doing avant-garde work, but just the, the sheer power and, and beauty of their work, I think, raised popular interest in the performing arts throughout the United States, which was completely unpredictable cultural effect of these exchanges. Um, and then we have hip hop in Japan. Um, the thing I'd compare that to would be rock, rock and roll during the Cold War. I mean, and I, you know, we're not in an antagonistic relationship with Japan, right? at least not especially right now, um, no more than with anyone else. Um, but Rock music was, as I'm sure a lot of you know, a huge uh, influence. Anyone who's been to Eastern Europe or Russia or East Germany talked about rock music with people of a certain age. Um, will hear, get an earful of you know, how rock music brought down the Berlin Wall and the Beatles did it and, and a huge circulation of rock music in a kind of Samizdat way in Russia and Eastern Europe. It's really, uh, there's a wonderful book by Tim Rybeck called Rock Around the Block, which I like the title, um, which is sort of a blow-by-blow -blow account of it, but it gives you a sense of, of how important that was. Now, the, the, the comparison I see with hip-hop is, this is something that's potentially very, very powerful, um, but it tends to be looked at rather dubiously by the 
the good parties in the State Department and the USIA in charge of cultural exchange. They didn't see rock music as being um, the, the, the part of American culture that they wanted to export officially. Um, I think they were happy. Eventually they did. I mean, the Voice of America did broadcast rock music eventually, soul music, Motown. Uh, they put that on their, on their schedule, I guess, in the, really by the late 60s they were doing it. Of course, they had the classic jazz program under Willis Conover, Voice of the Music USA, which was maybe one of the most successful forms of cultural diplomacy we ever had. Um, but the idea that something is both commercial and, and is and somehow subversive or, or adversarial at home, i.e. rock music in the late 60s, can work just as well overseas i.e. rock music in the Eastern Bloc in the 60s, especially 70s and 80s, um, is, an, is an idea that was well known to the Foreign Service and they were quite happy to let it happen, I'll put it that way. Now whether that would happen today, <laughs> um, I have actually heard that there's some, one little hip hop guy who's been uh, sent somewhere. Um, <laughs> I don't know if he came back or not. You know. um, but you know, I somehow can't see the current Karen Hughes's office uh, getting really big on finding the, the most um, roots, community-based hip-hop groups and kind of fostering a tour uh, for them of the Arab and Islamic world. I don't think that's going to happen for a while. I'm not sure it should happen. I'm not sure it would be the right thing to do. But I'm just trying to, to point out this kind of, what I'm trying to lead up to is the idea of a tension, a real tension between the purpose of the government in sponsoring cultural exchange and, the, and the, the sort of wayward nature of the arts and the wayward nature of people who are involved in the arts. And <clears throat> when it's done right, in the context where, first of all, you would want it to be done because you assume that the US uh, has a good purpose in projecting itself abroad. We can talk about that later. Um, but let's say, you, for the sake of argument, let's assume that this is something one wants to do. Um, how do you find the golden mean, which I pointed to up there, was my title. Uh, how do you find the golden mean between serving the government's purposes and not turning art into propaganda? This is an old story in American cultural diplomacy. And it's an old story because our cultural diplomacy, because we have in this country a tradition of um, limited government. Remember that? <laughs> There used to be an idea here in Washington once upon a time, um, badly executed, but it was some people actually said they believed in such things. But it's needless to say a very old American idea that government has no business meddling in the arts and meddling in culture. It's simply not government's business. This is a deeply ingrained American attitude. And it was part of the debate over establishing the NEA that if you had a national endowment for the arts, you'd have official art. And some of the people most opposed to the NEA back in the early 60s were artists, very distinguished artists, who were afraid of having a government ministry of culture. And this is very much in the American grain. So this complicates it even further. Um, I seem to have completely forgotten my notes here. Um, <clears throat> oh, I went quite a distance here. Oh, here's the quote I want to read you. This is um, Frank Ninkovich, who is a wonderful di hist a historian of public diplomacy. Uh, it's a quote from him describing the spirit in which the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace was founded in 1910. And this was really the first um, entry of the United States. We're not counting Ben Franklin back in, 19, in 1775 when he went to Paris. Um, this is America's first entry into the realm of what is called public diplomacy and cultural diplomacy. Uh, was in 1910 when the Carnegie Foundation for International Peace was founded. And this is Ninkovich's description of the spirit in which this private initiative was taken to um, increase uh, friendship with America around the world. And the emphasis is on private. Government, although representing the will of the people in a mechanical sense, could not possibly give expression to a nation's soul only the voluntary, spontaneous activity of the people themselves, as expressed in their art, literature, science, education, and religion, could adequately provide a complete cultural portrait. That was the spirit in which our cultural diplomacy began. 
No government. Let us do it. Um, but that didn't last, needless to say. Um, let me just end up by pointing to a couple of times where I think the, the golden mean was, was struck between the government's involvement and this spirit of independence of culture that has to be somehow preserved and it has to be not only preserved but to be cynical about it, it has to be convincing to other people. They can't, perce they can't perceive what's being done as propaganda and people are awfully quick to perceive things as propaganda, needless to say. Um, and now it, who knows? Um, one would be the, the jazz tours. Um, Penny Von Eschen's book, of course, emphasizes the government purpose in sending the jazz ambassadors in the 60s, which was to convey, was a sort of an, a reply to criticism of, of American racism on the part of the Soviet Union and of communist uh, governments and spokesmen around the world. She also points out that the musicians knew what they were getting in for. They understood that this was partly why they were being sent abroad, and they found lots of ways to, to distance themselves from this mission. I mean, Dave Brubeck wrote a, a, a mu short musical comedy making fun of the whole thing, and the white musicians felt the same way. Um, they, had a, they had a real distance from the ostensible purpose of the government. And of course, their influence was incalculable, just incalculable, uh, in many ways that went far beyond the immediate purpose of, of the USIA. The second thing I would mention would be um, the way, the, the, way the, the USIA would work at its best. Um, the USIA was mentioned before. For those of you who aren't intimately familiar with USIA, it was the United States Information Agency founded in the 50s to, um, it was a kind of self-contained agency, technically answerable to state, but quite self-contained and quite autonomous. And they were in charge of all the cultural exchanges, educational exchanges, the Voice of America, and so forth around the world, um, except in the communist world where they had to go through the embassies. There were two ways in which the government meddled with the USIA, and this happened over and over. One was, um, and this is a big item now. This is actually more true now than it was then, which was budget and accountability. I don't need to tell any of you who are involved in arts organizations how the government likes to meddle in what you're doing and find short-term benefits from what you're doing and when what you're doing is really a long-term effort. I, there's a guy I know at the State Department who compares this to, did I do that? Sorry compares this to pulling up a plant by the root every six months to see how it's doing. <laughs> <clears throat> but the other is more important, and I'll end up with that. And that's the ideological meddling, the, the, the pressure to stay on message, the pressure to, to, to use culture overtly as propaganda and not tolerate its waywardness and not tolerate um, the, the relatively untrustworthy uh, interlocutors, artists, and others who might be involved in this effort. And the people, I've been interviewing a lot of old foreign service hands from the USIA and the State Department about what they used to do. And one thing I've learned is they, the, the, the cultural affairs officer who was usually the low man on the totem pole in the embassy compared to the political affairs, compared to the political affairs officer, um, was usually the person, if he was any good, or she was any good, would go out and mix in the cafes and talk to people and know the artists and know the intellectuals, talk to all sorts of people who were not necessarily rabidly pro-American, spoke the language fluently, and whenever you really wanted to know what was going on in that country, you'd go to the cultural affairs officer. Because the political affairs officer, especially like in Moscow, they were just sitting there looking at the Kremlin the whole time, trying to divine what was going on inside and sort of waiting for cryptic utterances. The cultural guy was out, and I know one of these guys, was out circulating all the time and knew all sorts of people. So there's that dimension of it. Um, of course, well, I'm, I'm not going to digress. Um, I, too much. Um, this led to periodic, periodic eruptions of kind of meddling on the part of the, the higher-ups. Um, there are some famous episodes, if you've never heard of Joe McCarthy, 
uh, when Ed Merrill was uh, was uh, director of the first director of the OSI, sending his guys over to uh, Berlin and pulling books off the shelves in the America House. And the way the story I've heard it, they actually were getting ready to burn the books when somebody made a call and said, "This is probably not a good idea in Berlin." Um, I, I don't know if that's apocryphal or not, but th that was a famous phase. And then there was a phase under Frank Shakespeare, the ill-named Frank Shakespeare who was a USI director under Ford, who would go over to Moscow, and when he'd been briefed that the rooms were all bugged, he'd sit in a room he knew perfectly well was bugged, and say, the purpose of our mission here isn't cultural exchange, it's to overthrow this damn government. <clears throat> which, part, of, part of which prompted one English writer to publish a book recently called, Please Speak Clearly Into the Chandelier. But when this worked, under some other USI A directors, the really good ones, they gave people their head. They let these seasoned, fluent speakers, cultural affairs officers, people who knew the arts, they just kind of, they trusted them, they let them do their thing. They didn't try to micromanage them. And they allowed a kind of interaction with people who might be a little bit politically questionable, politically suspect, the non-communist left, emphasis on left, um, that kind of thing, was, was tolerated because people were given a sense of judgment. And you know, I think one of the ironies of this history is that that, that capacity to sort of trust and take risk and find good interlocutors I've been told, and I don't know how true this is, but I've been told it was partly because it was funded by the CIA. <laughs> and the CIA were very good at that sort of thing. And the CIA had no problem with making contact with all sorts of people who might be useful in some way. So that's a rather ironic uh, way of looking at it, but it's because of the slightly covert nature of it. Um, people were given their heads and they were given some free reign with some very good, I would say, with some very good outcomes, uh, ultimately. Um, this is not going on now. Um, my other picture is of satellite TV dishes on the roofs of uh, houses in somewhere in the Middle East. I'm not sure what the picture was, came from, but I could show it to you, but I don't have time to talk about it. I'll just, I'm, I know I'm going over, I'll stop. Um, all I, I'd like to just close by saying that, leave you with a question. Um, does this mean, in our present climate, does this mean that all such efforts for cultural exchange and cultural interaction to have, to, in a positive sense, should be left to the private sector? should be left to NGOs, to, should be left to the, you know, taken away from the government? Or does the government have some kind of role? Um, and should the government have some kind of role? I think we Americans have still really not answered that for ourselves satisfactorily. And the tension that we once were able to manage has become quite unmanageable today. Thanks a lot. Thank you.